despite despite the great weather, uh, or maybe because of the, the great weather. Um, so in the past few years, it seems like a whole new lexicon has entered the world of media. You hear a lot about echo chambers or fake news or misinformation or uh, filter bubbles. Um, and uh, it seems like you know these are uh, the, the, the most important or the most pressing topics in discussing relationships between citizens, democracy, and media. Um, this research project of, and I hope that I pronounced it rightly, Magdalena Wojciechak has revealed there might be a more pressing issue when we discuss these issues, namely the news diet of citizens or the lack of such a thing. Because if we are what we eat, we are also what we read. And it seems that, but I'm not going to tell too much about what you've uh, discovered, um, it's also very important what we don't read. Um, citizens who are less informed, of course, are also more susceptible to uh, um, susceptible to manipulative messages. And why this matters, and also what we can do about this, will be uh, discussed later in the platform. But first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Magdalena, and good luck. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming here. Uh, again, despite the good weather and despite the strike of the trains in Amsterdam, I really appreciate um, you being here. And of course, I greatly appreciate the organizers and Fatima and Karen, who uh, helped incredibly much with the organization of the event. And of course, our fantastic panelists, who you will hear from later. And of course, the project would not be possible at all without my wonderful collaborators and postdocs and students who are listed here in alphabetical order. Um, so I will try to keep my presentation short. It's, of course, challenging given that I'm presenting five years of research. <laughs> but uh, I will focus only on a few studies, and then, of course, I can share uh, some other work uh, with you later. So let's dive in. Exactly as was introduced at the beginning, many people uh, fear that unprecedented choice in the current media environment leads people to select hyper-partisan news sources, inhabit echo chambers, be put in rabbit holes of radicalization on social media, and counter misinformation. And the fear is that these kinds of behaviors online lead to polarization, misinformation, declining support for democratic norms, and many other problems that many societies are facing. So many scholars examine partisan news, echo chambers, misinformation, and algorithmic filter bubbles. And foundations uh, fuel millions to support research on these topics. So in fact, over six years ago, I received 1.5 million euros to study precisely exposure to congenial partisan news and to this similar news and their effects on um, polarization, intergroup tolerance, misinformation, uh, and other attitudes. So just very briefly, uh, with my wonderful team, we uh, fielded a very challenging study. Here is a graph of the study in the US, the Netherlands, and Poland, where I'm originally from, hence my unpronounceable last name. Um, and we combine over time survey self-reports uh, with online behavioral data from the same participants. So essentially very large sample, uh, samples of individuals in those three countries took surveys three months apart and submitted or shared with us their online browsing history. So to get what people did online, we uh, used Web Historian, which is an open source tool developed by my friend and collaborator. And um, the tool accesses people's browsing history stored on their computers displays it to them using different visualizations and allows them to submit their data 
to researchers. So I'm happy to talk about it later. It's not that essential. The most important point is that this tool allowed us to get information on everything that people did online during nine months. So that's the point. And people are willing to share that information with researchers for not that much money. So that's also interesting. So we had about 120 million visits in general. Again, very briefly, uh, we categorized the visits as being to news domains. We developed very extensive lists for per each country. We categorized the visits as being to left-leaning news, right-leaning news websites, or centrist news. And we also classified using kind of at-scale methodologies whether people visit visited political content or news about politics in their, uh, in their online visits. So, um, in the couple of studies I will mention, uh, we use subsets of those data, so not every study uses all, all this. Uh, but first, we wanted to check this pressing problem. Does exposure to hyperpartisan media polarize individual attitudes and makes people more hostile toward the other political side. So for example, um, a left-leaning person who consumes left-leaning news can develop stronger attitudes on a variety of political topics, immigration, uh, climate change, and so forth. And a person who is left-leaning but consumes right-leaning news can actually become a little bit more moderate, perhaps. That's what we wanted to test. Uh, so the title gives away <laughs> our findings already. Uh, just super briefly, because again, I want to keep this short, we found absolutely no overtime effects of actual exposure to partisan news on attitude polarization and so-called affective polarization. So people's hostility toward the other political side. Again, this, uh, I will just skim through that. And in another study, uh, I mentioned here because Karen tweeted about it, so she kind of made me feel that I need to include it. We actually tested whether exposure to hyperpartisan news from the other political side can generate polarization, the so-called backfire effect, or can actually attenuate polarization. So. Also, very briefly, the graph shows the design of the study. The major, most important thing is that we paid American partisans to visit hyperpartisan news on the other side of the political spectrum for 12 consecutive days. We uh, checked people. So, for example, a Democratic uh, participant was paid to look at far right news sources such as Breitbart or The Blaze, and Democratic participants were paid to look at, sorry, and uh, Republican participants were paid to look at, for example, The Nation and other very left leaning sources. We had an extensive checks to make sure that people, in fact, did what we, what we told them to do. And again, we found that these exposures had almost no effects on people's attitudes. So people were, again, seeing every day information from hyperpartisan news, and that didn't change their attitudes at all. So, just in brief, we found no polarization from hyperpartisan news. And again, we tracked actual exposure to those websites of individuals. And in another study, we found no effects on misinformation endorsement. We found incredibly limited exposure to untrustworthy websites among our sample. So kind of all the issues that many people worry about were a very small fraction of citizens online diets and didn't have any effects. And in fact, recent research also finds that most people don't inhabit so-called online echo chambers. Most people do not encounter misinformation online. Most people do not um, aren't put in the so-called rabbit holes of radicalization on social media and so forth. So 
there must be other explanations for the different democratic challenges that many countries face. And of course, I don't argue that the media are the only explanation. There are many sociocultural, global factors that contribute to that. But my suspicion or argument is that the drastically overlooked problem is the very low consumption of the good democratic broccoli, which is quality news among the population. So, uh, in fact, this is what emerged as a kind of key explanation uh, for our null results in, in the studies. So, we know that news is not as appealing as other categories of programming. We all have Netflix, we all have, or you know, some of us have Netflix or other online entertainment platforms. Uh, and many people see news as very complex or very boring, or both, <laughs> many people are actually averse to partisan politics. They are just done. I don't want to hear about that anymore. And there is research that shows that many people actively avoid news. So accordingly, across mobile and desktop, and uh, these percentages are from, the first percentages from the United States, uh, news accounts only for 4% of total online consumption. And Facebook estimates that news constitutes only 1.8% of what circulates on the platform. That's not that much. Um, and of course, and I had this conversation before the panel, that yes, more people consume news on television than online, but still, other categories of content vastly outnumber news exposure, and there is also some research to, to, um, to back this up. And in our data, and here I'm showing for, uh, data from three countries, in three countries across nine months, news accounted for an average of 3.4% of everything that people did online. And, you know, good for you here because the news consumption was the highest in the Netherlands, 4%, the lowest, surprise, surprise, in the United States. But still, those percentages were very low. And furthermore, most people do not go to news websites for political information. Actually, the solid majority of news visits in our data were to sports or weather or cooking recipes, so not to hard news. So in short, 96.6 of everything that people do online is not news, and the majority of that is not political news. Um, and such low levels of news consumption are democratically problematic. Um, we know that they may lead to uninformed, uninformed citizenry, uh, voting that's misaligned with individual or group interest, and also susceptibility to hyperpartisan or populist or misinformative, manipulative rhetoric. And, you know, for instance, we can think of Brexit or the 2016 uh, US election as good examples of low information voters being swayed to action by you know, emotional stimuli in the political environment. And we also know that news media exposure contribute to well-informed citizens, more stable political attitudes, greater resistance to manipulation, greater ability to recognize what's fact, what's fabrication, and so forth. So um, Essentially, now I argue that incentivizing greater news consumption, so greater consumption of quality news, this is important, I will come back to that, among citizens is very important and very pressing. So I avoid the simplistic assumption that all news, so to speak, are created equal. Right? We wouldn't want to incentivize hyperpartisan news exposure or exposure to very sensationalist tabloids. So we do need to focus on quality and verified news. And I will uh, mention that in a second. I will mention two studies just very briefly that aim to do that, aim to encourage citizens to consume more news on social media. Um, 
so, and we also account for a kind of algorithmic curation of what people see online per the expertise of one, hour, uh, one of our panelists. So, in the first study, we designed a very large uh, uh, field experiment on Twitter. So again, a platform that's kind of falling apart. When we started developing the study, it was still, you know, good, but uh, you know there have been many hurdles along the way. Uh, so we encourage social media users to follow and consume news using uh, Twitter bots that reply contextually to users' tweets about sports and entertainment and lifestyle topics and encourage them to cons follow news accounts and consume news. So here you can see Liz and Jacob, two of our bots, many of whom were banned along the way. Uh, and here you see how, um, how those bots were responding. So for instance, in the first part of the response, the bots were engaging with what the person posted. And then we had a so-called hard-coded component where we say, by the way, if you want to learn more about sports, consider, and we directed people to a news media organization, consider visiting a sports section of, say, the New York Times, and consider following at the New York Times. So um, we're still analyzing data. We find some results. And again, the, the project was a little problematic because somebody took over the platform and disabled many of the functionalities. And in the second study, uh, we promote exposure to quality news on YouTube, which is one of the most popular social media platforms. And we aim here to disentangle two factors that can promote, that can lead to low news consumption, which is the disinterest of individual citizens or the algorithms. So if low news media consumption is due to the fact that citizens do not see news as relevant to their lives or important, then nudging the users and reminding them that news are important can perhaps encourage people to watch more news. But then if low con news consumption is due to algorithmic uh, biases such that, that if somebody's interested in sports, they're only recommended sports over and over because that's what they engage in, then nudging the algorithm, so to speak, can potentially increase news exposure because news will be recommended to the user. So uh, in collaboration with uh, a few computer scientists, we developed an extension for YouTube that users installed. And here are some screenshots. Doesn't matter exactly what we did. But in the, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about it. But in the, we nudged users by creating this really realistic looking banner here that contained several prompts that were piloted before that essentially told people that news exposure can be beneficial to them, but also to society and democracy at large and so forth. And you can see here that the uh, people were, if they clicked here, they were taken to the news part of YouTube. There was also a little nudge in the search, to, uh, search box to watch the news. So that's how we nudged the users. And in the, we nudged the algorithm by essentially tricking it that a user is interested in news. So the, our extension in the background, every 10 minutes, watched news videos from quality news organizations. So essentially, we were adding news to users' browsing history or watch history to trick the algorithm that the user is interested in news. Um, and we selected those news organizations to be credible or kind of high on, uh, high on credibility and also rather centrist. So we used expert metrics to do that. And we are finding some promising results. So the algorithmic nudge indeed increased recommendations to news. And then when more news is easily available to the user online, people were actually watching much more news during the time of our experiment, and it lasted uh, for about three weeks. So stay tuned for the results. But I just wanted to mention that that's what we're still doing. But overall, just to finish up, um, I believe that the problem is less 
that people consume bad political information. The problem is that most people do not consume any political information. Um, so promoting greater engagement with quality news, online or offline as we will talk now most likely, can make citizens more resilient to misinformation, to populism, and can also pull the more moderate voices, those citizens who are now completely disengaged, onto the political arena and therefore minimize polarization. Uh, so I feel that uh, we need to expand our focus from the very hot and sexy and popular issues of echo chambers, filter bubbles, misinformation, to identify why people do not consume news, how to encourage people to do so, and how, again, we can make citizens a bit more resilient and democracy stronger. So that's it from me. Thank you so much, and I will look forward to the panel now. Yes, thank you, Magdalena, and con congrats on concluding your research project. Um, next up for the panel, I'd like to invite a few people up on the stage. Um, first of all, Nicolas Diakopoulos, who is an associate professor in communication studies and computer science at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, Alit Dijt Damstra, who is a senior research fellow at the Netherlands Scientific Council for Government Policy, better known as the WRR. Um, where she studies media and democracy in the digitalized age. And finally, Harm Ede Bodje, um, investigative reporter at Follow the Money, an investigative journalistic platform, and the co-author of the book My Opinions Are Facts, The Making of Thierry Baudet. And I will join them, and I forgot to say this in the introduction, but my name is Mark Lies Adriaanse, and I'm a reporter with uh, NRC Handelsblad, a Dutch newspaper. Yeah, so Magdalena, my, one of the things that popped into my mind during your presentation was, have we had the wrong conversation for all these years? Was all the fuss about fake news for nothing? I don't think so, right? I, don't, I, I think it was important because it did direct our attention to some issues that social media and the online environment facilitates. Uh, so it's not that they were absent before, just the scale increased. Uh, but I do think that somehow we stopped looking at the broader picture, just focusing on these other problems. So I don't think that the conversation was for nothing. It was very useful, I believe. But still, we know also research shows that there is now more discussion of misinformation than actual misinformation. There is more discussion uh, about polarization, so perceived polarization, the perception that the public is polarized increased at much higher level than actual polarization, right? So we are in a sense, we scholars and journalists are in a sense generating reality that's more gloomy or pessimistic than what I think it, it, it actually is. Uh, but, now yeah. You've done a lot of research about um, misinformation or about uh, uh, citizenship, democracy in the Netherlands. How surprised are you with these conclusions? And do you agree with Magdalena that uh, perceived misinformation and perceived polarization is a bigger problem than actual polarization at this moment? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, thank you, uh, first, Magdalena, for this very, very, very interesting presentation. Also very interesting and sometimes surprising results. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm... Um, I find this message very optimistic <laughs> um, because also the very low quality news consumption should be worrisome, I think, um, maybe even more than uh, the whole idea of misinformation, echo chambers and, uh, and um, filter bubbles. I was wondering, this also really touches upon the literature on news avoidance um, because people obviously avoid the news or at least the quality news. And at some point in your presentation, you said um, it is intentional. So people, they get tired of the news. It's all maybe too pessimistic or whatever the reason may be. And I was wondering, isn't it also maybe unintentional? And isn't the overload of information and also for people maybe with preferences uh, for entertainment are just not very inclined to click on the news that is more uh, uh, um, informative? So... 
I was, and, and also in relation to uh, your algorithmic nudging, if people intentionally avoid the news, then that wouldn't be a cure, right? So I would be very interesting. That was what I was really, um, yeah, I found that very uh, uh, intriguing and would love to hear more about that. Yeah. So is it intentional or not and what to do about it? So, yes, so there are absolutely, it's not that all news avoidance is intentional. There are many people who intentionally avoid news, so they're just sick of it. That was especially pre uh, prevalent during COVID because news we know tends to be very negative, tends to be kind of depressing. So people were just tired, but many people absolutely have, so to speak, unintentional news avoidance. They just may not see news at all in their, in their online ecosystem, for instance. And uh, what you mentioned about the nudges, actually we found that was a very important analysis. We found that um, our this increasing recommendations to news not only increased exposure to news amongst people, but the, it didn't decrease overall engagement. So people, it's not that people, oh, okay, I don't want to see news, so let me just not watch YouTube at all because, you know, those researchers are feeding me news. Uh, so, so, yeah, we, we found they didn't, it didn't have an adverse effect on people's on-platform engagement. So maybe for some people, just providing quality information information in a very easy way, right? So here it is, you know, I'm watching YouTube and it just appears and plays automatically after, you know, my music video or my yoga video or whatever, maybe that can actually make people a little bit open to, to this information. And then, so then it's not that they just don't want to see it. Maybe they just don't have the opportunity to see it, but then when it appears, they will engage with it. Well, that is indeed uh, a more optimistic yeah. uh, finding, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're on the more pessimistic side of this argument. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, well I think this is genuinely, this is very uh, interesting. And also, it, this, um, this is quite optimistic because it, it gives us <laughs> um, a direction of what to do about it, right? And this is doable. Uh, in the end, yeah. because I think that's, that's also what is key uh, to this debate, that we find it so difficult what to do about this phenomenon. Uh, I do have more questions, but maybe um, yeah, I'm, I'm there are to more uh, members more of the panel. from you too. Yes. Harm, you've worked at Dutch media for a very long time. You've worked at Vrij Nederland when it was still one of the more influential Dutch weeklies. Um, paid, then huh? a paid <laughs> with a lot of subscriptions. Um, then you worked for Nu.nl, which is a um, uh, free uh, digital outlet, one of the biggest Dutch news media. And now you're working for, once again, working for an investigator for a subscription-based uh, platform. Yeah. Well, some some remarks. Um, I just checked that the the main news here in the Netherlands, the television news on Saturday night, was watched by 1.5 million viewers, which is mm -hmm. more or less average, I guess. That means less than 10% of the Dutch audience watch the news at 8 o'clock. Um, of course, they have reruns in the night, so it adds a bit more, but still, it's 10%. Mm -hmm. That's more than your 4 yeah. or 5%, but still, it's only 10%. Mm -hmm. So, 90% mm -hmm. uh, of the Dutch audience do didn't watch that edition of the news. When I worked at Nu.nl, which is by far the biggest online news platform in the Netherlands, I always said to my colleagues when I worked there, you can count NSC Handelsblad, Volkskrant and Trouw and Parol all together, and then you don't even have the audience that Nu.nl attracts. I mean, it's really, really big. When I worked there, I wrote stories, and I didn't start at less than 150,000 views. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, 150,000 views, that's only 1%. Of, I mean, we have 70 million, but yeah. still, I mean, it's like 1%. So a major scoop scored like 1.5 million readers around the viewers at the audience uh, for the news, the 8 o'clock news, which is still only 10%. So I absolutely agree uh, with what you're saying, whether it's an online or it's offline or it's television, that the, the audiences are really small compared to the complete uh, population of a, of, a, of a city or a, or a country. 
about the echo chambers, I, I went to lots of uh, court cases um, uh, related to the uh, uh, activism around corona protests. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we had huge protests, sometimes they were very violent, people were threatened, um, uh, people in the our ministers, the cabinet was, people were threatened. So I went to a few of these court cases. And again, your, what you find here in this meta uh, the search of yours, I can confirm from sitting in the court that it's only 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 people who are inside this mousetrap and uh, who, who, who decide to go on the street with a torch in front of the house of the minister. It's just one guy. But he's but, very influential, though. Exactly. Yeah, but he's very yeah, influential absolutely. inside the echo chamber. Absolutely. And now it's yeah. going outside, but still, I mean, if, if I go to the Leitzeplein just last week, to the Russian tank that was parked there, yeah, you know, uh, he was there, but nobody recognized him. Hmm. I just checked some people. Do you know that's the fuck the fuck man who was in the street with the minister? Nobody knew. Nobody recognized his face. Nobody knew the story. Or some some knew the story. So still, I mean, his fame isn't that big. Mm. But I do understand that our secret services uh, and security agencies are really worried about him because people like him who are inside these traps can become violent Absolutely. and are a real threat to people's lives. Absolutely. So let's. So those are different discussions. There you go. Nick, can I jump in? Sure. So, so what I what I like about this this conversation and what we've been talking about, and also about your results, is that I think it really gets at this idea of the of the complex system of yeah. news consumption. Right. It's it's about news production and quality information or conspiracy theories, but it's also about news consumption and the, the demand for that information. And it's also about the algorithms and can you use algorithms to nudge uh, demand, the matching um, supply and demand and so on. Um, but I think what it, what it also gets at, um, and, and this is kind of where, where you were going, Harm, is that um, our our conception of why news is important, news consumption is important to democracy, um, maybe gets a little bit lost in the analysis in terms of, you know, maybe it's not just about that everyone eats their broccoli. It's about the fact that there could be a very small audience that has political implications for the entire society uh, because of some very cloistered consumption of information. And so I don't know what we do about that. You know, is there a way to address that in the complex system? It's not really about the supply of quality information anymore. It's more about the algorithms, the, the demand for the demand for really low quality conspiracy information. And I think addressing that is maybe a little bit different problem to try to deal with. But there's a big a normative assumption underneath is right, namely that polarization, but also populism is in itself um, a danger to democracy. Mm -hmm. That polarization should be um, prevented by news media, by, by professionals, and that populism in itself is um, anti-democratical, maybe? Mm -hmm. It's quite a, it's, uh, this was my main thought when I was seeing the algorithms, you're pushing people towards more centrist political positions. Mm -hmm. It's quite a big, Mm -hmm. political mo move to, to do such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a very, very interesting point that you're making. And I would say, but I'm not sure what Magdalena says about it, that there's an important difference in that sense between the, the partisan diversity across the spectrum and the fact that you kind of um, um, agree what the facts are, right? Uh, so to put it very simple, um, partisan uh, po polarization in the sense of partisan views, I think it's perfectly fine in the, in the democracy. It's something we should cherish, to be honest. But at the same time, there's this um, phenomenon of disinformation, and that's, I mean, and that's in some uh, instances very anti-democratic. And I think that it's perfectly legitimate to uh, want to... Uh, counter the second instead of the first. So that's, I think that difference is very uh, important to make, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> well, of course, uh, there, there, there are several things at the same time we're discussing here, I guess. Um, so, I mean, the danger of people who are in these mouse traps in one way or another. I mean, there were mouse traps in the 70s yeah. and in the 80s. I mean, that's something for this. Also, for a lot of people with torches in the Middle Ages, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, no, that's, then you enter the, the world of police and security services and judges. 
I mean, you can. I mean, that's that's from old old times, I think. Um, the other thing is that it's a relative small group, so you're right about the echo chambers, and I think it's the the whole nudging idea. That's algorithms and that's technology. But also, when I worked at Nu.nl, we did another thing, which is on our side, a journalistic side of the yeah. of the of yeah. the equation, is that we we not me but my colleagues they made articles for. Uh, people who couldn't really read, so low alphabetic, or how do you say that in English? Uh, you know, uh, explain stories very simple. Super. Explain what the king said on king on, on his yearly speech, but then in without difficult words, Super. and try to reach another audience, an audience that is low lettered. That's Absolutely. what you say, English. L low literacy. Low literacy. Yeah, yeah, low literacy yeah. Uh, yeah. part of the of the population, Super. and I think that that was really a strong idea. And they, they do it. They do it all the time now. Nice. And it's part of the, the whole setup uh, at Nu.nl. And I think that's a way to reach out to another yes. part of the audience. And, um, of, of course, uh, our public television does the same. They have the Jeugdjournaal, uh, so for young people. But in, in reality, lots of people who are not really well-educated watch Jeugdjournaal to just get yeah. by. Yeah. And, and I think that's also especially for newspapers, uh, quality newspapers like NSC Handelsblad, as far as I can see, don't, they don't think about yeah. those kind yeah. of things. But, but there's a big if here. The big if? Money. Money? But, or, or, or bigger if, access, basically. So uh, I remember when I entered journalism school in 2011, uh, you know, this was the moment where newspapers were dying, there was no future in paper, we had BuzzFeed and we had Vice and all these other new outlets, and they were the future, uh, and they were the future ones. You know, they, uh, BuzzFeed News has gone bankrupt recently, or they closed down, Vice is going bankrupt, uh, and these were free media publications, bringing quality news, especially BuzzFeed, um, has done a lot of, well, you know, oh, BuzzFeed News, BuzzFeed yeah. News yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It was a good free online publication, making it very accessible to a lot of people. Nupent now is a very good, free uh, publication. Um, but of course, someone needs to pay for, uh, for the content, for making a quality newspaper. Advertisers, but also in the past 10 years, we've seen a movement towards, you know, 10 years ago it was 80% advertisers, 20% uh, readers. It's completely, completely flipped. Um, for subscription-based, subscription but to get access to these quality newspapers, you need to pay for it. Yeah. So um, with BuzzFeed dying and other online free publications in trouble, I'm quite worried actually about mm -hmm. creating the access or the possibilities of access for people, especially people who might want to touch into more quality news, but you know don't really know where to look. Um, so that's a, 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 a bigger problem yeah, yeah. behind all this, and that's also something that I want to ask you about. How can you um, find more people, or how can you make people more susceptible to reading mm -hmm. quality news then? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, great, great questions. As you mentioned, we've been touching on many things, and I just want to clarify one thing that I, I do think we should care about echo chambers and filter bubbles and, and misinformation. So it's not either or, but I do think that for many years now, many people have been focusing on the on the latter without taking the broader uh, step back picture of the of the overall media ecosystem and users' consumption. So yeah, because again, it can be 10 people or 100 people in bigger countries, but for example, it was how many people stormed the capital in the United States, right, on January 6th. Not that many, but still they have kind of shaken, you know, January this... Exactly, right? So I'm not saying that we don't need to, no, no, no. We don't need to care about them. We should tackle both, both, uh, both problems at the same time. I just kind of want to focus our attention on the other one. But I think mm -hmm. that... Yeah, but... I think that... The, the whole capital uh, stormers, I, that's for the police and the security services. But for reaching out to, to the audience, the general audience, that's more for people who think about algorithms and the, the owners of YouTube and the owners of Facebook to yeah. put news more in. Uh, and so to serve democracy, they yeah. should think about that. And yeah, when your algorithms are completely finalized, they should introduce it, maybe paid by George Soros or whatever. <laughs> and we as newspapers and media outlet should think about reaching the audience that is not really uh, into news. Yeah. Do you agree? Well, I, well, I just want to, yeah, I just want to um, maybe second that and, and, and point out, I think, the underlying premise here, which is that 
news media um, is the only route through which people can encounter quality information in society. I mean, we have to ask the question, if only three or four percent are clicking on news media or maybe 10 percent watching news in the evening, wh where are people getting their information? Like, and like these people are voting, right? So how are they getting informed? I mean, they're getting information somehow. I mean, maybe it's from their social network. Maybe it's um, more casually on social media, and that's not captured in the metrics of what people are clicking on, but it's scrolling past, or they're seeing something that's politically related on TikTok, which might not fit the category of political information, but it kind of frames an issue in a particular way and gets them to think about the issue in a particular way. So, I mean, I think this is, this is all kind of underlying, like, how do we define news? How do we define quality absolutely. news? And how do we define news sources? Absolutely. But yes, absolutely. That's why in, the, in one of the studies that we did, the, 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 kind of the, the table I showed, we were also looking at exposure uh, to political information conceived very broadly outside of news. Right? So for example, when you read Women's Health magazine, you can see a news story about women's rights or abortion, for example. Right? Absolutely. At the same time, I think that many people just aren't informed, period. You know, I teach... Uh, American undergraduate students at the public university, and I teach a class on political communication. And always at the beginning I ask, do any of you consume news? I have 50 students in a the class. There are maybe two hands up, right? And then I see, do you see any information on social media that's about politics? You know, maybe 10 hands up. And those are students. That's, you know, the elite, the future of, of, our, of our countries. You know, one student asked me, what's the state of the union? You know, it was right after, you know, the state of the union, right? Let so, alone watch it, right? So, and Dutch, Dutch people know what it is. And it was a student who had no idea, right? So I, I think that many people are just not seeing that information. They talk about many things. They don't necessarily talk about politics. So, yeah, um, I, I would like to uh, um, tap into that. Um, you sh sure you have studied this um, generational differences yeah. in your data. I, yeah. I mean, there are many worries about younger generations not consuming the news, <laughs> but also not consuming the news directly, not online, but um, f um, indirectly through platforms or through search engines, etc. And that I mean, those numbers are on the rise. At least they are in the Netherlands. I know that the numbers are from. Reuters, so it is self-reported, exactly. which I now realize yes. is not maybe the best measure. But what is your take on that and on those generational differences? Do we need to worry about um, declining trends in direct news consumptions among younger generations offline as well as uh, online? So, you know, I, I, I will agree with what Nick said, right, that we shouldn't be too, so to speak, elitist and only focus on, you know, credible news sources, news organizations, that as long as people are getting their veggies, <laughs> maybe it doesn't have to be broccoli, right? But if they put the broccoli on the pizza, like at least they're getting some political information. It doesn't have to be in, um, you know, in Volkswagen, but, uh, but I'm not sure whether people are, right? So also what, what I showed in one of the slides, uh, Facebook estimates that what from everything that circulates on the platform, again, this is news, right? So uh, news is only 1.8%, right? So some people maybe, again, many people report that they see news, right? Or politics, uh, incidentally so-called. But we also know that, for instance, algorithms, right? They, they, they recommend to you content that's aligned with what you are already interested in, with your past behavior on the platform and so forth. So is your pa if your past behavior is mostly entertainment focused and most people go to online and to platforms for entertainment, so you will not suddenly see news in your feed. The same if your network, if your friends on social media are not politically inclined and are not interested, you will also not see. So, you know, those of you who are here are, of course, interested in what we are discussing, but sit 
with another person who is kind of very different than you are and look at your Twitter or your Facebook or whatever platform you're using and somebody else's. It's a completely different world, right? So I think many young people aren't seeing that content. And, and what is your, uh, if we talk about the broccoli on the pizza, <laughs> what is your idea about the um, traditional news brands in that sense? Because for many people, uh, all the generations, they were socialized with those news brands and also connecting those traditional news brands, the broccoli, so to speak, to journalistic values like yeah. uh, in the, uh, yes. independence and uh, pluralism and diversity and factuality. Um, and I think I, I see a big risk there that younger generations just they kind of have their broccoli on the pizza and are not that socialized with those brands anymore. Isn't that a risk? What is your idea? Well, what are if, your if, if I can add to that a little bit, I think that some of the biggest news media in the Netherlands are completely unknown by most people in this room. Yeah. Namely, NOS Stories, uh, which is uh, based on you know the public broadcaster, but bringing it for younger people, which is, I think, more than a million uh, 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 followers on, on Instagram. It's a platform like uh, Sam Mokro, um, which is mostly unknown, but has hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram. Um, and those are there are platforms where younger people are getting their news, but it's just not, you know, it's not yeah. NRC, yeah. um, which kind of worries me. But um, <laughs> so does it matter? Yeah. Like uh, Alice was asking as well, mm. because you could argue it is broccoli, right? Yeah. Yeah. It might not yeah. be broccoli so the way that, yeah. you know, so it might be genetically think... modified, but it is still broccoli. <laughs> So I think that that's okay, right? As long as we have, as, okay, I don't know those platforms personally, but uh, so I don't know whether they have that adhere to those journalistic standards of kind of objectivity or verification of the facts, right? But as long as people are getting some veggies, yes, I believe that's that's okay, right? So we kind of also need to embrace that, you know, the the, the time when everybody consumes the, you know, eight. PM or 7 PM newscast is 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 gone because now there are, you know there's satellite cable and online so not everybody will congregate along next to their TV set and and maybe I'll just add in a little bit about some of the algorithms that we've studied on these yeah. platforms as well I mean and we haven't looked at Instagram and you know we haven't looked at the the, the Dutch um, media system but in some of our um, studies of looking at TikTok for instance in the U S we actually find that there's really not very much news at all by traditional standards. Um, and even if you start following a bunch of news outlets on TikTok, the algorithm just doesn't pick up on it. It just doesn't really serve news to people. And so even if you were news interested, how do you convey that to the algorithm to get it to get into a positive feedback loop where it's showing you more information, more news? But, but I, I don't know if you looked into that because uh, you're you're working in the U.S. But is there a discussion among the, the 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 owners of these big platforms about news? Is it an issue for them, or are they just in it for the money and they don't care? Well, my sense about TikTok is that it's really was founded as an entertainment platform, and and news is you know news can news and yeah I think. Um, they, I think they even lump news and entertainment into one trends category, so it's not really its own thing. Yeah, but actually those, the, the owners probably are mostly in it for the money, and which is essentially user engagement. So actually a few years ago, Facebook uh, uh, announced that it's decreasing its news in the algorithm. So it went down from, I think, 4.5% a few years ago to you know 1.8 right now, and that was a conscious decision because the fear is that if there is more news, either there will be problematic content uh, or that users will, ser will simply disengage because the users don't want news, right? So that's also where we kind of come to the, uh, to the issue of content, right? That that's a lot of the news, and, and in the U.S. it's dramatic. It's focusing only on conflict. It's focusing only on negativity. It's only you can open very high-quality, you know, broccoli news organization, and it's always clashes between, you know, the two sides, yeah, right? So people this is, are... Yeah, this is something that I, I did want to touch upon because the classic journalistic response to this is, Sure, we get it, but you know the world is conflictual, and we are just reporting the conflict that's out there. Mm -hmm. And when we would focus on the consensus in society, we would, we would be you know not bringing or not reporting society as it is. 
Well, I'm uh, so, sort oh, of. Oh, I, so I don't. I don't think so, right? <laughs> I, I no. I absolutely don't think so. I think, for example, so I um, I have been living in the United States for the past six years before I lived in Amsterdam. Uh, but for example, during the you know the State of the Union that I mentioned uh, on CNN, for example, the President uh, Joe Biden was speaking, and the camera went to to the audiences, and they found a Republican politician whose name I forget who was rolling his eyes, right? And that's what the CNN reported, like somebody who was obviously disapproving of what the Democratic president was saying, right? But I'm absolutely confident that there were many Democ uh, Republican politicians in the audiences who were agreeing with President Biden, right? But it depends on what you, what you focus on. Uh, well, I, I, I want to add to Harm, actually, because he's <laughs> looking pretty skeptical about this. <laughs> No, no, I'm not skeptical. No, 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 I'm not. Um, uh, I was just, um, I had something in my eye. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm not. I think that, um, I think it's, it, it, I, I, I totally yeah. agree with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So getting, so, but, but, mm -hmm. this, but this only answers the question of polarization, right? So if you would uh, report more on consensus, you would perhaps have less polarization and as a, or does it also lead no, to more, more people could people actually maybe right people would maybe tune into news mm. as well because many people are just sick of the negativity at least that's what some surveys find so is, is that the solution to getting more people to I mean, there, there's for sure deals? not, not w one, one solution only, but I think it could be one for sure. And again, based on what, what, what people are saying, that could be one, one of the solutions. And I think we also, again, need to look at the larger media ecology, right? So it's not just about the, that media is reporting on conflict. It's that the algorithms love controversy yeah. and conflict, and they amplify that because it gets clicks. Yeah. And it's that feedback loop, right? So that shows the media, oh, yeah, we need to do more controversy, more conflict, and yeah. let's do more of that. Yeah. Yeah, but, so even if you have a, like your newspaper, I mean, it's a big newspaper. There's lots of people working there. So even if you have 10 articles about conflict and two about not non-conflict and four neutral and, and some about entertainment, the ones with the biggest juice is where it, where the, and that's picked up by the, by the algorithm. So even when your own newspaper or, or your own title is trying to be balanced, the, the, the unbalanced stuff will, will be picked up and, and, and amplified, isn't it? So then the point is to it's all the, it's the all algorithms, right? That's your <laughs> point. Well, well, I mean, I think one of the issues we might be dealing with is, is the perception of polarization, right? And the fact that an algorithm amplifies the perception of controversy because... Again, to your point, if there's two out of the ten articles that are controversial and those, get, those are the ones that get picked up, that creates a larger perception of controversy than there actually exists, maybe. Yeah, yeah but it's also a paradox. I mean, for instance, I was here at this tank, just like I told you. Um, so uh, the, the Fakuman was shouting, there was a megaphone, there were lots of people uh, very agitated, as you might all have seen. Who, who saw this? Uh, interaction between the director of the Bali and this guy who did try to do the interview and he got really angry. It's a very international audience, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a very international... So some people saw it. Um, so, I mean, this was really pumped up in the Dutch media. Um, but when I was there at the tank, one day, the, the Fakkerman was there shouting. The next day, there was nobody and the tank was just there. Yeah. So that was more or less... The normal state of affairs. There was a tank from Russia on the lights square. There were people walking around it, parents explaining to their children that the tank was there and what the reason it's there, and they just walked on, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. But the moment that yeah. they're shouting and there's a little fight, exactly. it goes all over the internet, exactly. and people think there must be a huge issue exactly. on this square, exactly. and it's not. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sorry, that's okay. what you mean, right? The yeah, absolutely. It's the effective, the perceived yeah. polarization in yeah. society, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe a related issue, but I'm not sure whether it is indeed part of your uh, research. But um, this also uh, touches upon discussions that I know that journalists have in newsrooms about giving attention to certain political actors that really... Um, um, fuel this polarization in society and have very provoc uh, yeah I, now i see your reaction um provocative um <laughs> rhetoric yeah but that's i mean that's that's a dilemma right because it is it is consumed 
big time by the audience and still there is a responsibility i think on the journalistic side to uh, give this attention or not yeah. well uh, yeah um i think it is a sort of a, a chicken egg discussion that is taking place in a lot of newsrooms like is the fact that we're reporting on this this uh, uh well let's let's name him let's name him Thierry Bardet. Thierry Does reporting Thierry. on Thierry Bardet lead to more seats in the polls and in and in the second chamber of the Netherlands or in elections, or are we merely reporting on his pop, uh, popularity? Um it's probably somewhere in between. I don't because I'm skeptical of the whole idea that he's big because media reported on uh, about him, but I'm also skeptical well, I mean, there's always a, a breeding ground for these kind of politicians, I think. Um, but but when, when I worked at Nu.nl, the, the the editorial board, or the, the guys who were, I mean, I was most, most of the time here in Amsterdam, but the guys at the, at the desk, let's say, it was always a discussion. I mean, do you give attention to Thierry Baudet for people from, the, from abroad? He said, I'm a politician uh, whose only goal is to create uphef, uh, to arouse and that uh, does touch with this information, yeah. oh, he didn't say disinformation no. because he's, he, his, his facts are the truth, isn't it? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, um, um, d d d d so we always had the discussion about, about him and other politicians at the desk because many times, or not many times, a few times, I went and they said, we're not going to publish because why should we? And, and that's also the case with other politicians, populist politicians, whose only goal it is to, to arouse attention yeah. for themselves and for their ideas. So I think that there's a shift, at least in Dutch media, going on from the times when uh, Pim for Time came up, you know, this former politician who was killed, uh, um, to now that, that, that media are putting the, the boundary much higher. Also, you see that at talk shows. Mm. And, and is it working? Like, do you see... Um, and this is also... I'm very interested in this. Do you see um, when media are um, reporting more and more populist leaders, does it lead to more or less people tuning in or tuning out to quality news? Because that's basically the claim. Yeah. So uh, sadly, yes, right? So there is research uh, that the traffic to news websites after Trump uh, stopped being president yeah, yeah. actually decreased. Yeah. Yeah. So people were following more news. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but so Newport uh, uh, decided... Exactly. Not to do it. Yeah, yeah. But that's actually also, right, also, that, that's, in my, in my view, that's a wonderful, wonderful um, decision because we know that also when reporting on misinformation, we know that more people who would never know that something was said that's not true was said would actually learn about it. So, and, yes, yeah. it's not about the partisan... Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's both, it's Just right? very quickly, it's not about the partisan position of, the, of this political actor because it's always the accusation, right? That you, uh, that you um, um, don't give it, that you would... Um, freedom of speech, right? That you uh, uh, don't give the room for the yeah. politicians. That's not... I, I don't think that's the issue here. The no. issue is the disinformation part of it. And that you, by repeating those claims, you give room to it and attention. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's both, absolutely. So it's right, it's on the one hand giving uh, additional audience for pieces of information that would never be seen. It's also giving additional platform to politicians who are provocateurs. But, but, um, but, but if yeah, the claim is that more people are tuning into quality yeah, news when uh, there's a yeah, polarized yeah, yeah, yeah. politician, doesn't that yeah. undermine the whole point that people want more consensus-based reporting? Is my question to yeah, you? Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. That's a good. That's a good paradox, right? Because it's not my point that that's what people want. That's what people say they want. And at least yeah. people say that they tune out of politics. But yeah, it is a paradox. People say they, or many people say they tune out of politics because it's too conflictual, right? But then also during for President for Trump, exactly, yeah. right? They were tuning in more. Yeah, but but at, yeah. at the moment we at the media say, no, we should really uh, watch out and, uh, and don't bring everything, mm. um, bring every story. But then uh, Thierry Baudet starts to build his own little empire and, every, and everybody who wants to follow him and wants to see what he's doing can go to his, news, his own news desk mm. that he has now. Mm. Mm. And, and it's that, not a big empire though, right? No, it's not a big empire. It's a, it's a small little echo chamber he built for himself. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I want to I wanna get to the audience because I can imagine that there are a lot of questions and there's the first question um, about this topic. Um, please be 
polarized but civil. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think you were the first to raise your hand. Hi, uh, Magdalena, thank you for your happy presentation. <laughs> uh, my name is Jo Bardoul and I worked with the University of Amsterdam. Um, we are talking about quality, or you are talking about quality news all the time. And I find that a bit problematic. Of course, I'm a bit older. I read all these four, four newspapers that were mentioned, uh, not on paper, but on iPad, but very traditional. But when I talk with my students, for instance, also journalist students, they didn't watch the news very often. Had they watched talk shows or these news shows with uh, stand-up comedians and so on. So the, 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 the question is, what is quality news? And maybe the whole definition of quality news should be redefined in the sense that it is also elite news. It is yes. formal politics. Uh, if you're here in Amsterdam, for instance, I read also Parole. It's, it's a small newspaper, and most of the people here, they don't get that news. Uh, at, so, uh, in a sense, uh, it should be relevant news mm -hmm. and yes. quality news. Yes. It's, it's, it's such an old-fashioned uh, uh, assumption about politics and about yes. political participation, etc. So, that's, I, I wanted to, pro, uh, to, to question, you know, yes. that definition uh, mm -hmm. of quality news. No. Which Which seems seems to be quite news. central. Yes, no, that's absolutely that's a wonderful point. And the second of also which and that that's true that that's what I emphasized during the presentation and, and kind of hearing the discussion, we did say that as long as people consume some veggies, right, that aren't so some news, some political information. But I agree, and that's what Nick mentioned as well, that now we need to redefine, we need to have different perceptions as to what is relevant political information. So yes, so ab absolutely, Pe ab your point is very well taken and I agree. But, but who decides what, what, what relevant information is? Yeah. The individual. The individual consumer, I suppose. So the, in, in a democracy, then, yeah. they, they now have all the tools available to them to observe the world through various media channels. They don't need elites necessarily to construct an account of the world to tell them how things are going. Yeah, but then, but then kind of as long as, but then what happens with those journalistic values, right? So that's, so that's I'm something being, that I'm I, trying to be pr okay, provocative. Okay, okay. <laughs> you said that in a such a matter of factual way. That, <laughs> circa, yeah. Right, so Completely yes, I agree with you, right? That, that also what you mentioned about... It's too easy. <laughs> no, 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 but like we don't have definitions, right? We don't have kind of, we don't yet have any metrics or theoretical or practical as to how much a person needs to consume, what it is that they need to consume, where they need to consume it in order to be like an effective citizen, right? We don't have that. And I don't have the, I absolutely don't have the answer yet. But for example, what you mentioned about your newspaper providing Kind of more lay or lower, you know, not elite explanation of what's happening. There that are so many regional newspapers in behind the organization New.nl, and therefore, because the, the national newspapers were always elite newspapers, exactly. and yeah. the regional newspapers, they didn't reach everybody. Yeah. Not most of my family come from a peasant background, and I'm the only one, I guess, in the family of eight Catholic, you know, so in Poland, you know that also. Uh, uh, I'm maybe the only one, or only two, that read newspapers, you know, the rest do doesn't. And okay. The question was, where do they get their information? In the past, it was very clear in my village where I came from, mm -hmm. everybody uh, voted for the Catholic party, mm -hmm. you know, as they sometimes still do in Poland, maybe. Uh, so, and now you see that, uh, so that the whole idea about po political participation, that there are people that uh, uh, had information in the past and now that is going uh, uh, down or something is also highly questionable, yeah. uh, I think. But uh, sorry uh, for... Uh... Yeah, well, I, I see... Uh, uh, thank you for your question. I see another question there. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great discussion. Uh, my name is Sumit Mera from the RIVM. Uh, Public Health Institute. Um, I was actually, uh, I found it striking like the first study, if I understood it correctly, people reading news of the opposite side, like they weren't really influenced by it. 
Um, perhaps it's because of they're getting paid or they're not really paying <laughs> attention to it, but besides that. Um, but then as a solution it is presented, people perhaps should consume more news, but maybe eating broccoli doesn't really increase your uh, uh, vitality. Mm -hmm. So what does it really prevent? I mean, I think there's a difference between consuming news and making informed decisions or not, or not getting polarized. So is it a solution? So even if people mm -hmm. are going to watch more, much more news, is it going to prevent some things we are uh, concerned about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is more news consumption, is your question, is it going to uh, prevent for more polarization? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in, in many of our studies, and that's a very good point, in many of our studies, we find that exposure has no effects. And we test many, at, we, we, even in some studies, we tested knowledge. We tested political participation, intentions to be politically active. We tested, uh, you know, misinformation, endorsement, polarization, and so forth. And we find no effects at all, right? So, in a sense, then the question could be why promote something that you yourself find has no effect. But also, I, I do believe, and, um, and that's something that social science is not well equipped to test, that these exposure have cumulative longitudinal overtime effects, right? So in that study that you mentioned, uh, people were paid to do that over a period of 12 days. Uh, Right, that's not that much. I, I was thinking like, yeah, of course, something should happen during that time, but we found that very little happened. In other studies, we are looking at much longer time periods spanning six months or nine months using all the data that we have, and we also don't find anything, <laughs> right? So, so again, kind of there, 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 there are several related questions that on the one hand, we are looking still at a limited time span and that maybe Right, seeing some information can make people kind of what you are also doing with with easier language, right? Can make people kind of hook in, right? Like, oh, I see this. So then the next story they will see some or they will understand it more because they will know what's happening. They will have the background. And the second thing is also that uh, that in my in my in my work we were looking only at online consumption, right? Because we know that when you ask people, do you consume news or how much, everybody says yes, I do seven times a day, seven days a week. Which we know it's not true. People overreport because there is a social desirability, right? That consuming news, it's again, it's that elitist idea that yes, you should be a you know a news consumer. Um, so we only look at online behavioral data. So also maybe people were not influenced because maybe they had some other counter, counter forces outside of their online environment. Or maybe they were, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. We were looking at a small slice. So maybe that's why also we're not finding effects. Yeah, I would agree with that observation that it's a very layered yeah. It's a very layered uh, process, I guess. So it's very tough to go from one or two experiments with, oh, with short-term uh, uh, manipulations to drawing conclusions how people really process the information. Uh, yeah. and, and of course, promoting news exposure is not the only remedy. Uh, far from it, right? We should have civic education in schools. We should have like many more things that... that many countries do not have. Nicholas? I think it also potentially prompts a, a question for the journalists on the panel, which is, you know, to what extent should news organizations be responsible for evaluating the effect and the impact of the content that, the, that they produce for society? Are you measuring understanding political participation as a result of consumption? Are you interested in understanding those things? Maybe not you individually, but maybe your organizations. I don't think organizations. I think you know organizations are looking into a lot of uh, impact, basically. But the impact that they're measuring is mostly clicks. when do people? No, not <laughs> clicks. Really, like I know it's all about the money. In the, in the six <laughs> years that I've been working for my newspaper, I've never heard someone say clicks. Huh. It's mostly about how long people read something, okay. yeah. um, and how engaged they are with it, and. Um, you know, if it, if it gets a conversation going, if it gets yeah. people um, more interested in this specific topic and clicking through oh, to yeah, clicking yeah. clicking through to uh, other stories that are about this topic, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's what, mm -hmm. in my experience, media organizations are mostly interested about. On a more abstract level, 
I do feel that in the past, well, basically since Trump and Brexit, uh, media and liberal democracies are more aware of the role that they play. Like Washington Post talking about, you know, democracy dies in darkness, and that's why <laughs> buy a subscription, basically. Um, but there is some truth to that, and I do feel like it's more, it's a more pressing issue than perhaps 10 or 20 years ago. But Harm, you you are much more experienced in Dutch media than I are than I am. No, I, I've well. Um, I think that at least at Nu.nl, um, they are really thinking about their role and, and reaching out. Uh, the one example was these uh, low literacy. Uh, but the other thing is that they always think we have to explain mm -hmm. even the most simple things. Super. Uh, w what does it mean? Because always there are people there at the, at the desk who ask the most simple questions and then I say, yeah, but everybody knows. No, we want to have a story about this, so about what you're saying now. Just explain what, what's going on. And that's, well, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. But on the other hand, I mean, your question about uh, do, do, do they think about the effects of their reporting on the level of uh, awareness or democracy or resilience? I don't think so, really, no. I, no, no, I don't think so. No, no, I mean, maybe. Why not? That's not, I, I don't see it as our role, basically, but I'm just a simple reporter. But I don't also think our editors in chief, maybe on a, maybe they do some discussions sometimes, but I, I, maybe guys like you should go to these desks and, and talk about it. But I, I, I mean, everybody's busy with their day to day affairs, and it's, 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 it's difficult as it is. I mean, uh, um, and, and I think it's very difficult to measure. But still, if you have discussions about not covering certain populist, uh, I mean, that w I would see, see that as a, a kind of taking responsibility as well. Sure, but that's in day-to-day -day business. Okay. Yeah, sure, okay. That fits into the day-to-day -day routine, yeah. but not in a larger picture. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for one or maybe two short questions. And I see two hands, so that's great. Or Thank you for the great discussion. I just have a question about um, how do you see the future of news in relation to these you know, new media that are coming up, and especially social media, because as uh, Magdalena, you mentioned the actual news, like Facebook and you know, social media channels are actually pushing down or pushing out a little bit, or lowering at least the news that they're sharing. My point would be, is there really even a point for them to not do that? Because obviously a lot of the politicians, institutions, actors, you know, whoever, wh wherever, you know, news is happening, they obviously have direct access to people, to a lot of people through these media, you know. So my question would be, um, what's the role of news still in relation to that, you know, since, since so much can be consumed directly from the people, you know, Trump can send a tweet and people already know that it happened. Um, and also, yeah, like, is it, do they, yeah, w and what's the future then for, 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 for news agencies like yourself in, in that respect? Well, I, I, do, uh, I do recognize what you're saying because I've had experience as a political reporter where parties would say to me, yeah, there's no point in talking to you despite having, you know, 300,000 daily readers because we have our own channels of reaching the people that we want to reach. The thing that I'm mostly worried about right now is that, you know, the death of BuzzFeed News, BuzzFeed News, and of other free quality quality uh, online publications that were quite good in reaching people who are not willing to pay six hundred dollars a year for a New York Times subscription, but who are interested in reaching or in reading quality news. Um, and what I think is going to put uh, pressures on professional professional media organisations in the in the upcoming ten years is the death of paper. Um, so, yes, I'm very confident that the New York Times will still be existing in 10 years. I don't think they're going to be making an, a newspaper on a daily basis anymore, which, you know, makes a lot of sense. But it also it's going to put pressure on the financial models. And then the question is going to be, if BuzzFeed News, uh, BuzzFeed News died, if Fies died, and all these other platforms, what is going to be the role of a New York Times or an NRSA or a Follow the Money in a very hyper-fragmented media uh, landscape? I'm not too optimistic, but hopefully you are. I guess just to throw something else into the mix here, I mean, you're also staring down the development of new technologies yeah. like generative AI, which, you know, if you've played with Google Bard or Bing Search, their chat experience, 
I mean, these are these are not good experiences right now, but we can expect that over the next five years they're going to get better and better, and they're going to again totally disintermediate um, and become the interface that yes. people use to information, including all kinds of news information. And so, you know, imagine a world where um, you don't you don't get your news from a trusted news brand. Um, you you go to a search engine and you type in a question and it creates essentially a news article. It writes it right. It, you know, in in thirty seconds you have a, a personalized, tailor made news article. So what is the role for the news organization in that world? It's basically um, well, sorry sorry to say, news organizations lost the distribution game to social media. Um, it, this means they're going to start losing the production or the or the writing. Um, aspect to the craft. So where does that leave media? It leaves them in news gathering. That's the most expensive part of producing the media is uh, actually it, taking the time to collect the information. Um, yeah, I think I don't. Uh, I don't think it's just going to be news gathering. I think our work is going to be more storytelling uh, because I do think that style and writing a good narrative journalistic piece. Uh, you know, actually, I think the opposite of what you're saying when it comes to news gathering. I think that when a lot of uh, a lot of the things that we're publishing right now could be done could be really much chat GPT. You know, small new articles where just bringing factual information. A lot of our daily time goes to to those kind of things. Whereas when you talk about good writing, good narrative writing, good narrative reporting, going out, speaking to people, going to uh, an event where there's no robot, what, where there are a lot of people, that's going to be so, you know, the positive twist might be that um, AI is going to take a lot of the shitty stuff out of our hands, making us uh, or giving us more time to do actual reporting on the ground. Well, that's what I mean by news gathering, reporting, collecting right. information. Yeah. But and I and I don't entirely disagree with you in the sense that I think there will be a market for really high end, powerfully written material. Um, but I think we can expect the market to continue to shift. Uh, isn't the problem also that from a democratic perspective you want to have those journalistic values covered, right? And that the part of this whole information environment that you can actually uh, gu uh, guide by those values, and that you can actually um, kind of regulate in terms of public values, that it gets smaller and smaller and smaller in relation to the complete information environment we live in. I think that's the worrisome picture I have in my mind for the next few decades that, I mean, sure, it will be there, it will still be there, it will survive in that sense. And I think also that this is already part of a larger trend that you uh, described, that the traditional news brands focus more and more on those storytelling production instead of the fast news, because they kind of have lost ground to the new.nl um, uh, companies. But I think from a democratic perspective, that kind of worries me, that the Kind of the area that we have control over is getting smaller in relation to the rest. Yeah. Final question, question in the back. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the great discussion. Super interesting. Um, so I was curious about the part, uh, Magdal Magdalena, you mentioned uh, in your presentation about avoidance or sort of this lack of engagement. Um, so I was wondering if you have had a look or have planned to have a look at um, the sort of mechanism behind that. So is it sort of the sentiment of like quantity over quality, um, some sort of like media fatigue almost, or is it a sense of, uh, of a news consumer that they already know enough that they don't need to sort of search further. Um, sort of wondering what your thoughts are yeah. on that. Yeah. So we, we haven't looked at that specifically in our study, in our data, but uh, concurrently there has been growing research looking at the reasons for news avoidance. As, as we spoke earlier uh, kind of in the panel, there are, uh, there are many different reasons depending on, on, on the audiences. For those who used to be very engaged with news media, they now report or say during interviews. So there's fantastic work that's being done using both in-depth kind of qualitative long interviews or surveys as well. So they would say that news are too negative, 
right? That they, they just don't want to watch news or read news anymore because it's too negative and affects their well-being. And so it generates anxiety or stress and so forth. Some, and yet other people, for example, are overwhelmed. So it's kind of but what we've also touched on, that there's just too much information available online. So people just tune out because they have this problem that there's just too much. So they don't know what to choose. They don't know what to trust. And they just select something else. And yet there is another group of people who just doesn't see uh, news as relevant to their lives. So, you know, my life is okay. Here I am going to work, going to school or whatever. So why should I care? Right? So that's yet this other group. Um, and that's the group precisely for whom I believe the algorithms kind of could, could, could really make a difference because uh, if they... The nudging, yeah, because if, uh, right, just kind of putting some information in their environment. And there is probably another group of people, I don't know to what extent here, but for sure in the US, where there is very little um, social security, very little um, kind of social welfare, right? People who may have to be working two jobs and, you know, and, and feed their kids. So they don't have time at all to even look at that because they worry about their day to day survival. So I think that there are many different reasons, and that kind of comes also in, in studies. Yeah, we haven't, personally, I haven't looked at, into that, but other studies have, and it's very complex. Nicholas, the yeah. final words. Oh, oh. <laughs> no <pressure. laughs> I wasn't ready for that. Um, <laughs> just, just to channel the, the, the inner technologist um, that I am, since I'm actually a computer scientist by training, um, you know, I think there's an untapped potential of personalization yes. uh, and the... Um, capabilities of, let's say, generative AI to personalize things like headlines to make them more relevant to individuals. So, sure, you know, write the high-quality news article um, about whatever is 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 going on that's important in the world, but then tailor the framing of that message to individuals uh, to to arouse their connection to why is it interesting to me. Yes. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a real potential there. We've done some studies um, uh, in my lab at Northwestern where, where, you, can, where you can see um, opportunities there. So that's a, that's a hopeful message to close yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Harm. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Al Alit. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, audience, for coming here today. Um, well, that's it. If I'm not wrong, we'll be home in time for the 8 o'clock news. So that's good news. <laughs> <laughs>